Now you're very welcome along. So OTB Sports is back for another series of in-depth chats with some of the biggest names in Premier League and Irish football history. We will have behind the scenes access as well. We'll be talking to some of the legendary names from the biggest clubs. We'll be meeting the crucial people behind the scenes as well who make a Premier League club what it is. It's all in association with Cadbury FC, official global partner of Liverpool Football Club. And you can check out cadburyfc.com for updates on promotions and giveaways. And I am very happy to bring in the Liverpool fan who became Liverpool captain, Niamh Fahey. You're very welcome. Hello. Hi, Joe. Hi. Thanks for having me. No, listen, thanks for doing this. You're fresh from training. In fact, you may just have come from training now, I think. Yeah, yeah. Not long in the door. So, um, yeah, quick shower and ready to go. <laughs> OK, brilliant. And how was training? It was good. Yeah, we're just um, match day minus one. So it's always a pretty easy session. We have uh, Sheffield in the cup tomorrow. So uh, nice and handy. Very good. I mentioned there the Liverpool fan who became Liverpool captain. So it's kind of an, an amazing uh, thing. I guess when we're saying Liverpool fan as a kid, you're watching the Robbie Fellers of the world because women's football isn't really in your living room all that often. It, yeah, exactly. Um, uh, as a child growing up, my my heroes were Steve McManaman, Robbie Fowler, Michael Owen, uh, Stephen Gerrard, obviously, when he was coming through. But yeah, that uh, those were my idols as obviously the visibility of women's football wasn't there. But um yeah, it was, it was Liverpool all the way for me from a, from a young age. OK, so amazing now to be putting on a Liverpool jersey. It's like free gear. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> yeah. I don't have to pay for the kid anymore. There's always perks, isn't there? A hundred percent, it's a dream come true to represent the club and you don't actually realise how special it is until you're actually pulling on that mat shirt and you're looking at the crest and you're looking at the badge and it means a lot. Mm. So were you from, well, I mean, I know you were, Sports mad household growing up, I guess that's your gateway into the world of sport. And it wasn't just soccer, obviously. Yeah, obviously come from a Gaelic football background. My two brothers played for Galway and won All-Ireland. So uh, it would have been a very much a Gaelic football um, a football family. But yeah, anything that was going with the ball, we were playing and I was playing. And uh, it just so happened that was the, the competitiveness at school time was, was soccer because it was easier to play probably than Gaelic. And it just stemmed from there. Um, but yeah, I, I grew up in a household that was very much sport sports uh, dominated. So I think that probably drove me in towards um, yeah football and Gaelic football. And the uh, say the soccer slash football. I mean, everyone calls it different things in different parts of the country. Uh, so when you're playing that at school, is that like a, a mixed boys and girls playing together, or were the girls all playing the football on their own, or like because it's not that long ago, obviously, but it was probably a different time in terms of what quote unquote female sports were and male sports were so what was your experience growing up my experience is i um i grew up in a country area so a little village and i think because numbers were obviously small in the school everyone tended to to muck in together there was no kind of gender defined roles which i think um was was obviously brilliant and in my class uh, there was a good few girls that used to play at break time i definitely wasn't the only girls obviously the number of boys would outnumber the girls, but there were still a good few girls playing um, playing at break time. So, yeah, I think where where I grew up in Clannan, um in the countryside, that obviously uh, that obviously helped with integration between boys and girls in different sports. Because we had Vera Pau on the show last year, and it was really interesting chatting to her about player development, and she was saying that when it comes to female sports like soccer we've got to be careful that we don't necessarily just think, oh, well, it's best to separate boys and girls early on. She was saying that the best players in her experience have come through like you did, i.e. up to a certain age, mixing it with boys and girls and developing in that way. So it's, it seems like just by hook or by crook or by accident, you kind of got the best education. Yeah, I 100% agree with that, I think. Um, the only difference is really when it is when it comes to that kind of those teenage years and the physical differences start to take over. Obviously, boys are are quicker and stronger, so that's when it um it becomes more apparent. But when you're younger, those physical differences aren't there, so you get the technical ability and um yeah, just play, playing and mixed gender sports. I, I think is a great idea, and it does obviously um develop you as a as a female player having played in with, with boys makes you quicker, um uh, makes you stronger. Just yeah, I think there's just loads of benefits to having um, mixed teams and, and growing up in that kind of in that kind of way and in your teenage years then Eve, were you straight into organized uh, female underage soccer with referees and jerseys and 11 aside and all that or, or what was your route yeah I was kind of a bit more uh, 
Gaelic football was my priority in my teenage years. That was my number one sport. Um, so f- so- soccer at that stage was kind of number two. Um, and as I got a bit older, progressing with the Irish team, I, I had to m- make more of a conscious effort to focus my time onto soccer. And yeah, I obviously joined Sol Till Devon then, and that was a uh, 11 aside uh, senior team. Um, and yeah, it kind of it grew from there, but I was definitely more of a Gaelic football uh, yeah. person throughout my teenage years. Yeah, you're kind of in a very uh, humble way, just sidestepping the fact you did win an All Ireland with Galway at the age of 16. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, exactly. If I won an All Ireland, it would be like on a T-shirt at all times. I'm to, okay, we, <laughs> you're dancing around that fact. So you were good. You knew what you were doing on the Gaelic pitch as well. Yeah, it was exactly. I I knew what I, I was knew what I was doing, but um, yeah, there was there was a lot of us. Uh, we grew up in a kind of a a really talented era I think all the way from my under 14 to minor to senior there was a really talented Galway team right. and that kind of just took off and uh, obviously yeah, it ended up with us winning a senior All-Ireland in 2004 which is our first and only uh, All-Ireland to date so that was an amazing uh, achievement obviously yeah does 16 year old you take it all in no I don't I, it's not possible uh, I think obviously now looking back it's um it's an incredible achievement to have done that, but I don't think at 16 you have the, the mental capacity to take that in. I think at the time I probably thought, oh, this is the normal, this this might happen every year. And then obviously Cork come along and uh, blew us out of the water the next year in the final and then continued to dominate for however long. I can't even remember how many years they've dominated for. So mm. yeah, it's, um, it doesn't work like that. So obviously I have a different appreciation of it now. Yeah. At what point does the soccer overtake the GEA in your mind in your pursuits it overtakes when I'm probably under 19 so minor um the chance to play at senior international level and having to make that decision and just obviously making the decision knowing that I could test myself more uh playing at international level playing against countries playing against the tops and then also having the chance to play semi-professional at that time it was semi-professional um, was an opportunity as well in England so I just felt like I had more opportunities to explore going down the soccer route whereas yeah, Gaelic football I obviously won the All-Ireland and had a lot of success there but I just thought yeah there was more area for growth if I, if I pursued the soccer. Mm. So just to give people a very blunt potted history of your career we mentioned the win with Galway in 2004 when you're 16 years of age You make your Irish debut in 2007. You go to Arsenal in 08, and you're there at Arsenal from 08 to 14, where I should mention you win 12 trophies in eight seasons, which is a bit ridiculous, including a domestic treble. You are Senior International Player of the Year three times. There's a cruciate injury in 13. There's a spell at Chelsea and Bordeaux, and you pitch up at Liverpool at 2018. So again, that's just a very potted history. Would you have taken that as you set out in your career at 17, 18, 19? Has it kind of surpassed expectations? Look, it, it reads pretty well, I have to say. It does. It does. It sounds, it sounds all right when you're reading it back to me. <laughs> um, yeah, without, without doubt. I never never thought that what, what has happened in my career, and I've been very fortunate at different clubs, would have been the way it panned out. So without doubt, I would have taken, if someone had said that was the way it was going to go, I would have taken that hands down. Because am I right in saying you have a master's in pharmacology and even were working for your, some of your spell with Arsenal? So like education and a professional avenue was very much open to you. Definitely. I was very conscious of the fact that at that time it was a semi-professional game. I had no idea that obviously I hoped it would go fully professional and we were training as full-time pros. But I always had in the back of my mind I needed a backup plan. So I very much focused myself to get my education, to get my degree and then it just so happened that I happened to work for two years while I was um, while I was playing as well with Arsenal, and that just gave me great experience and, and balance and grounding of what it actually is to to work, you know, nine to five or whatever, and, and just put that work in. So um, I, I was happy with the route I've chosen, and I would recommend it for anyone really to have a, a balance in their life. Mm. It must be nice as well, even to have that safety net of an education and something to fall back back on if the worst happens in in whatever shape or form it may happen to a career. I mean, that must be a nice safety net to have. Most players wouldn't have it to the same extent, I'm sure. Exactly. I think you, as a sports person, you never know when a serious injury is around the corner and uh, you don't want to put your, all your eggs in one basket. And I think, especially now as I'm getting older and, you know, retirement questions loom and, and you wonder when, you know, you'll finish up playing. It's always nice to know that I don't have to 
to start from scratch again I have something in the back pocket so it's a it's definitely a insurance insurance um blanket for me for the record I had no intention of asking the retirement question I want that <laughs> on the record I wasn't going to do that to you uh, did you enjoy the work nine to five work I did I did I enjoyed it at that time because it was my you know first job in science in a in a research lab so nice. Um, we were doing a lot of biopharmaceutical uh, research and development into new drugs for different patients with different complaints with hemophiliacs and all this kind of stuff. So it was really interesting to be able to like make novel things, make drugs. That was that was always an interest of mine. So that so from that point of view, it was a very interesting job. OK, I'm sure. So over the last 18 months, when I was reading articles about the impending COVID vaccine and couldn't really understand them. You probably could take a very genuine and serious interest in what they were talking about. Yeah, we. I would, I would, my expertise area wasn't virology, but I would obviously have a, a good fair bit of knowledge into, you know, what goes into making a vaccine and obviously yes. the, the different processes and regulations it requires to get that into, into market. So, um, yeah, it was, a, it was a massive achievement, I think, from basically everybody to be able to get that vaccine in the time frame that we did. Yeah, you see, I've no appreciation of that. I have heard lots of people say this is, you know, I was thinking, oh, my God, a year to wait a year. Uh, did not appreciate probably what a triumph it has been and what, like, a, frankly, a miracle it's been to get it over the line so quickly. Exactly. It can take it can take years. Um obviously five years, six years, but, you know, everyone was a little bit worried about the time frame it took, but obviously you had so many minds coming together and when there's a time pressure, it just shows you what's what's capable. So, um, yeah, it was a remarkable achievement. Will you go back to that world when you do eventually leave football as a player? Um, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, right now I've kind of I'm weighing up a few different options I, I always have that there and it's something that if if I want to go back into I can but yeah I'm kind of hoping maybe to keep a few other options open with still working in the sporting world. Mm. So tell us about Liverpool then and the opportunity to move to Liverpool it's a, in, an incredible period at Arsenal like I said eight seasons 12 trophies I hope that's right I haven't done you a disservice there and you basically win everything you can win in the game effectively and there's domestic trebles and then the cruciate injury happens, which I'm sure is a big setback. When did you first get an inkling Liverpool were interested? Um, I suppose for me, it was when I went to Bordeaux in France after Chelsea. Um, I was kind of, I was there in France, a, a really enjoyable experience, but mm. I missed the the cut and thrust of the, the English league and I was kind of longing to get back to that. So uh, obviously my agent put a few feelers out and what came up was a few clubs and then obviously Liverpool was an option and then as soon as I heard Liverpool was an option I jumped at the chance right. um, yeah being a lifelong supporter and the chance to go there so um, yeah so that's basically after my year in France I wanted to get back and, and Liverpool opened up and then the rest is history as they say yeah and I mean the crazy thing is that Liverpool are not in the Super League relegated in the pandemic year on the dreaded points per game basis. I think there were still eight point eight uh, games to go rather and it was tough luck. We're implementing this uh, rather blunt tool. You're going down. So uh, to say the least, I'd say a few football boots were thrown against the wall in that dressing room. Yeah, that, that was, uh, that whole experience was extremely frustrating. With the, It was so tight down there as well. Um, I think there was only three points or even a point in it at that time between yeah. about four teams down near the bottom so with eight games left to go it was a huge amount to fight for so uh, I, I was kind of, I was more in shock to be honest that they made that decision I didn't think they were, the FA would actually make that decision and obviously they did so yeah um, I can I can be a little less angry about it now because so much time has passed but obviously at that time I was yeah it was it was sickening and it was I was furious really yeah, you've gone from livid to extremely angry. You're cooling down. Yeah, but slowly. you can you'd be able to gauge exactly where I was when we got the news on <laughs> when we found out first. And so at championship level now, how how quickly can we expect Liverpool back in the big time? Because obviously, the expectation was that Liverpool would come straight back up. The club took a lot of criticism. I mean, it's not it's not a good look even for the powers that be. In the same year, the men are winning the league for the first time, having won the Champions League, and the women's team has been relegated. They're open to accusations of not resourcing the team well enough. So it was, I remember it was a big story at the time, and there was criticism at the time. Where are we now in terms of getting back up to the Super League? Yeah, I think there was a lot of uh, you know fair criticism at the time because I don't think um, we were we were structured in the right way, and obviously there's been a change in management and a change in board behind the scenes, which has 
basically restructured the whole women's setup and and is doing things you know um, as good as what's been done at other clubs if not the top clubs so that has all helped and obviously this season we're having a really good year under Matt um, Matt Beard who's just come in this year so um, yeah it's 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 been a lot better a lot of things have been fixed off the pitch which basically helps us on the pitch and you can see like the progression has been there this season with the team so um, yeah we, we hopefully will be in the mix to come up this year we definitely don't want to be staying down in the WSL any longer no I can imagine WSL 2 sorry yeah <laughs> any examples of things which have improved um, it's it's been wholesale changes to be honest um facilities wise we've obviously increased budgets there's been a host of players that have come in um the squad has gotten bigger there's a lot of backroom staff that have come in um all, all top top people so yeah there's been there's been a lot of behind the scenes work that's going on so you've been over in the uk now since 08 07 08 yeah territory i know you were back i was reading you were back during the pandemic and spent some time at home which must have been nice is it mad to think you've been away from home for so long such a big portion of your life do you miss home do you feel very settled in England will you come back to Ireland when it's all over that that experience of being away you'd be very interested to hear about that yeah I I, I don't feel like I'm I, I still feel like I'm the first time I've ever left that I'll be back and I, I don't feel like I've settled like I'm settled here but I'm not fully settled always yeah I I will uh, eventually hopefully return to Galway um I yeah, it's it's basically as soon as I have a chance to go home, I go home. All my family are in Galway, and um, yeah, it's it's nice when I get the chance. Then obviously to be around them, and you miss out on a lot of family stuff being over here. So I, I do feel like I'm a, on a bit of a secondment, and yeah, I will return just one missed, day. Hopefully, all going well. Just miss that rain too much. Well, it, uh, to be honest, I haven't come to the, uh, the, the tropics of Liverpool because it seems to rain here just as much as it does in the West. Uh, what's Liverpool like as a city? Yeah, it's amazing. It's great. It's yeah. um, you know, it's a home away from home. It's probably the most settled I've felt in a in a place since I've been over. Uh, the people are so friendly. Um, it helps. They love. I suppose everyone has a bit of Irish ancestry over here. So as soon as they hear the accent, they want to ask you where you're from and all that. So um, yeah, no, it's it's lovely to be here and to have that warmth to the people. And then obviously it's a great city as well culturally and everything else with nightlife and there's loads going on. So uh, yeah, no, it's it's a great it's a great spot. Here, you're a pro. You can't be out enjoying the nightlife. I thought that definitely not. Definitely not. <laughs> only only very rarely. <laughs> and did you find London tough? Because that's a big beast of a city. Yeah, it was, it was well, not tough in a sense, but it was exciting really because, yeah, we were on the outskirts, obviously near London Colney and Hertfordshire, so we were um, kind of on the borders. But, yeah, the, the opportunity to go and explore London was there. And, yeah, I really enjoyed that, actually. It was a, a, another, amazing, another amazing city with loads to do. So, yeah. yeah, you were never bored when you were living there. Yeah, I can imagine. I guess this is the great adventure when you take off as a professional sports person and spend time in these places. You just never would... Otherwise, you know, that's one of the real perks of it. Well, for, for sure. Like we've, we've been to so many places that um, sports and soccer in particular has given me the opportunity to see. So, uh, yeah, that's one of the massive positives and something that I'm really grateful for to, be, to have been able to experience so much. Uh, can we talk Ireland? Because uh, I think suddenly everyone's very excited. I mean, what a, what a big night in Helsinki for the team and a big result. And suddenly all the possibilities are are open um thanks in no small part to some last ditch challenges from yourself when things were getting sketchy enough a uh, big night for the team i suspect you could sort of see it in the body language afterwards when you're high-fiving each other it's like we're on here let's let's not let this slip now let's go yeah you can see at the end obviously there was a, a lot of emotion from the girls and there was a lot of pressure on that game because um Obviously, with the Finns being second seed and for us to have any chance, you know, we need to be taking points off them. So uh, to get the result there, a win was was a huge plus for us. But um, yeah, we've got two massive games now with uh, with Georgia and Slovakia in November. So uh, we have to keep our feet on the ground. It's just one step, but uh, it was a huge step at the same time. Yeah, because I'm sure you're all conscious of the fact that you started the last campaign very well as well. And it doesn't guarantee you anything. And that's a painful recent memory, I suspect. Definitely, we we slipped up with away to Greece and um, other other results as well. So yeah, with the Ukraine game as well. So 
uh, you can't take anything for granted. And especially now at international levels, the the level has risen a lot and teams are obviously a lot better organized. So it can be tough to break down teams. And, you know, that's a different challenge for us. We're, we're backs to the walls and we're good at defending. But when it comes to breaking down teams, we've probably struggled a bit in the past. So um, it's a challenge that we'll, we'll have to step up to. And um, yeah, hopefully with this group of players, I think we have enough quality to do it. Yeah, this must be the great unticked box for you to get to a major tournament with Ireland. This, I mean, I, I can imagine the desperation. For sure, it's a uh, it's a lifelong uh, ambition to to get to a finals with Ireland, and I obviously had thought maybe it would have happened before now, and it, it hasn't. It's eluded eluded me, eluded us, and um, but obviously it's it's something you keep chasing, and right now I'm in the mix with the girls, and it's uh, yeah we're we're full full steam ahead to to try and qualify. Mm. You've had an amazing journey, really, with Ireland in so many ways on the pitch and off the pitch, like it's kind of mad how recently we were reading stories of the team changing in public toilets and handing back tracksuits and the treatment and the dichotomy between the male team and the female team. What are your memories of that time and the fight, I suppose, for really some basics? Because it was kind of extraordinary. I, like We can all remember the press conference and the, the whole team or most of the team having to kind of explain what was going on and, and, and like I said, the fight really for a long time it is kind of extraordinary. I'd be really interested in your memories of that and were you angry at the time? Is it more, more so in hindsight you look back and kind of scratch your head a bit at, about, about the treatment? Um, yeah, I suppose we were always aware that, you know, it wasn't good enough, the the standards that we were we were putting up with basically for so many years and we knew like, again, a lot of those things off the pitch, if they're not right, it's very hard to concentrate and do your job on the pitch. And we, we just felt, you know, it got to a certain point that enough is enough. You know, we have to do something. We tried obviously a lot of times to fix, fix the issues internally, but it was, it was just going nowhere. And, and after a while we, we were left with no option and that that was the only way to make a breakthrough. And at, at that time it worked and we're glad to, yeah. you know, have that now as part of, of history. And obviously to have moved on to, to, you know, to where we are now, which we're in a, a, a so much better place. Um, and yeah, we're obviously we didn't want it to happen, but it had to happen for things to improve. And we were led by, you know, Emma Byrne, who was our captain at the time. And, uh, a lot of strong figures there, leaders in the in the group that helped us, um, you know, have the strength to carry that through. And do you remember at the time, Neve, were you hesitant about going public and kicking off this um, storm, I suppose? Or did you, did you think, yeah, no, it has to be, it is the right thing to do? Yeah, I, I for sure was, you know, hesitant because it's the last thing you want to do because you don't know what's going to happen. You know, you're only a player at the end of the day. You could easily be um, dispensed of by the manager or whoever, you know, you're seen as a problem and sometimes it's, you're viewed as a problem and you don't know what way it's going to go. But um, I think, yeah, we were, as much as we were, a few of us were hesitant, we were very sure that this was the only way possible for it as we'd explored every other avenue. So mm. uh, there was such a... a strong buy-in and the collective of the whole team um so when when everyone was on board with just that power and unity we knew we were making the right decision and did you get a pretty immediate sense of public support yeah i think exactly once once it went public of some of the stuff that you know we had to put up with i think there was probably a bit of shock to be honest that that those were the conditions and those were the the standards that our, our Irish uh, senior women's team were were being asked to do so um yeah when we got that public support it just you know steadfast we were just as a group you know this is the right thing we, we need to carry on with this yeah uh, so Vera Pau's come in and, and, and seems to have made a big impact the Tallis Stadium thing is is really lovely to watch uh there's always a great atmosphere there it seems like a, a, a good size stadium for the support levels now i guess the ambition ultimately is like let's get to the aviva and let's fill out the aviva but at the moment it seems like there's a lovely relationship in that stadium there's a comfort level and even the fans afterwards you guys are so good about signing autographs and i guess you know that generation in five ten years time are going to be in their 20s and Everyone else is going to be chasing them and they'll be very, you know, they'll have strong memories, I suspect, of your team and be very much into your team. So it seems like it's at a, lo at a lovely place. Uh, I'd be interested in your sense of Tallis Stadium, maybe moving to Aviva down the line or how you think all that's working. Yeah, it's great. At Tallis at the minute, um, the girls are buzzing when, we, when we're there for the home games. Like the atmosphere is really ramped up in the last couple of games. You can see the crowds that are there, you know, young girls, young boys, adults all coming to support us and, 
especially against the Sweden game, I noticed at the end when we were pushing, you know, a couple of long balls, we really felt the crowd get behind us and nearly pushing us over the line to try and get that goal. So, um, yeah, it's, it's fantastic, the atmosphere there. And then probably on that point, I'd, hopefully we could when it gets to max capacity, we could sell out Tala. That would be the next step. And then, you know, from there, yeah, get why not the Aviva? But, yeah, we're, we're growing in a fan base and we're obviously really appreciative of all the support we're getting. Yeah. Well, look, Ireland loves a bandwagon, so... <laughs> Well, exactly, exactly. We just need to keep winning, that's all. <laughs> yeah, but I, I do get the... And it's a, it was a pity with the last campaign because all the matches on TV, the public awareness, you could feel it growing, the campaign growing. It was such a pity the last campaign fell away. I suspect with this one, the whole thing is ready to take off, like a World Cup. You could just imagine the hype. Yeah, for sure. I Like like you said, uh, Irish people, we, we get behind anything, especially when there's a sporting success. It doesn't matter what it is. So when we when we succeed, we're really good at supporting each other and, you know, flying that Irish flag. So I could imagine the reaction if we do and hopefully when we do qualify for the World Cup, what that will be like. Yeah, fingers crossed. Um, so hopefully we see you back in the Super League next year. The standard of play in comparison with when you went over in, say, 08 to now. Like, I don't have reference points because it just wasn't on TV 08, 09 territory. But I know I even, I watched the recent game between City and Chelsea in the Cup and the standard is phenomenal. I mean, the technique on display is really, really good. So I presume it wasn't there in 08. You must have witnessed a fairly dramatic jump. Yeah, I think I've I've seen it go from like any, any sport, when you go from a semi-professional, non-professional to a fully professional league, the difference is very clear in terms of fitness, in terms of technique, in terms of tactics. You know, the game has grown a lot since when I first went. I was obviously part of a, an unbelievable Arsenal team as yeah. well, which was full of internationals. So we were kind of an entity to ourselves, whereas a lot of the league at that time was was unprofe- was not professional or semi-professional. So, um, yeah, I've witnessed a, a massive growth in the competitiveness of the league and also the standards. So, uh, yeah, it's 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 been a joy to, to be a part of. Yeah, well, hopefully you're back in that top league very, very soon. As for the male counterparts, is there much of a relationship there with the men's team? Like, would you come into contact all that often or are they pretty separate entities most of the time? Uh, we're pretty separate. We're at, um, we're obviously at the minute at Tranmere Rovers uh, at training ground and obviously the men are over at Kirby. So there wouldn't be much interaction. But um, yeah, there's there's good rapport between the staff. I know there's a lot of crossover between, uh, in terms of the staffing sense. And then obviously we've been on pre-season tour together in America uh, to two seasons ago. So right. no, there's a, there's a good relationship there, but we don't have much crossover day to day. Okay. Uh, the Premier League is pretty interesting. Can I put you in pundit position for a second, get your thoughts on the current state of play? Chelsea look very good. Liverpool are definitely back this year. Man City or Man City. And then there's kind of a, I suppose, a bit of a chasing pack, um, not least Manchester United hoping to do better than they're doing. Um, the Klopp impact at Liverpool and where Liverpool are, I'd be um, interested in any thoughts on that. I, I, I don't know how often you get to Anfield even to watch them with your own... Um, with your own matches to play? Uh, yeah, I'm lucky enough that our games are on Sunday and a lot of the guys' games are on Saturday. So right. I get to, I go to anyone's that I'm able to go. I was actually at Brighton there, unfortunately witnessed the uh, the 2-2 draw. But yeah, uh, yeah it's, uh, they were in the mix. Um, and I think against Brighton, it was just a blip. So I'd be fully expecting us to be there, thereabouts at the end of the year. You're witnessing, if you're getting to go to Anfield then, you're witnessing some pretty special performances from from some special players. So I would think you're keeping a close eye on the likes of a Van Dijk. Yeah, definitely. He's a joy to watch. Um, he just makes it look so easy. Yeah. Uh, he basically, he looks like he's in second gear most of the time. So <laughs> to be able to watch him close up and see how he does it is is fantastic. Um, but yeah, a lot of those Liverpool players are a joy to watch and we're so lucky to have them at the club at the minute. Yeah. Uh, what Mo Salah is doing at the moment is kind of hard to fathom. Yeah, he's probably the best player in the world right now, isn't he? Um, yeah. He makes something out of nothing. And yeah, it, another player, you're watching him and he's he's unbelievable. He's He can come out of space or no space. He's just able to hold that ball and then obviously uh, get goals from nowhere. So um, he's he's having a special season for sure. Because you with your defenders hat on, I suspect you're watching football all the time with your own defenders hat on. If you get too close to a Salah, he'll probably spin you 
And if you stand off him, everyone's saying, what the hell are you doing giving Mo Salah space? You're asking for trouble. So there's like a bad option and a worse option there. Yeah, you're you're so right. I think a lot of people say, you know, keep him on his um keep him on his right foot, but you've seen him in the last couple of games shift and shoot onto that right foot and blast it into the top corner. So I don't think there is a, a best way you could sh- uh, could show Mo Salah away from goal. He just seems to have the answers right now at every opportunity. So um yeah, it's, I I can imagine it's a nightmare trying to defend him. Yeah. So well, we'll see how the season goes. Um you mentioned it first, so don't don't um, don't come at me here. When wait, what are your thoughts on retirement? Another five years minimum. <laughs> <laughs> That's been very generous. <laughs> <laughs> I don't I don't know. Um, I I always just at this age I just go season by season and see how the body is and how I'm going, how I'm playing. If I'm still enjoying it, don't look too far ahead now. Um, but yeah, I'm, at the minute, I'm fit, I'm healthy, I'm playing well. So mm. yeah, I, I feel good and I don't see why I would stop. So um, that's that's just where I am at the minute. Yeah. And are you enjoying it as much as ever? Yeah, I'm enjoying it as much as I ever did. Probably more because, you know, we've we've got so much to play for at the minute and it's so competitive with getting back up to the WSL with Liverpool and then obviously the Irish tr- uh, team trying to qualify. So I'm, I'm, really, I'm really enjoying that competitiveness again. And uh, yeah, being back in the English league, although WSL too, it's it's still fantastic for me to be here at Liverpool as well. So I'm I'm really enjoying it. Okay, that's great to hear. Uh, we did this, Robbie Fowler, and we'll do it with you. There are some quick fire questions in. Great. And, uh, <laughs> well, these are the prize winners. We picked the best ones. Some of these are just not fair. So, for instance, O Liverpool at O Liverpool. <laughs> you can plead the fifth on this, I think. Who was the better GA player, Gary or Richie Fahey? Ooh. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> Why well, that that's literally impossible to answer. <laughs> it's a disgraceful question. Um, it's a tough, that's a tough one. <laughs> so Leah Ward wanted to know best player you've played with in club football? Uh Kelly Smith at Arsenal. Um yeah. Um just ridiculous talent. Uh, she was obviously coming to the end of her career when you know the media started coming on board, but she she had everything. I remember actually when we were training at Arsenal, uh, she was just doing a session outside. I think Thierry Henry was you know looking at her while she was doing a session, and she was like, "Well, she could play in the men's game." You know, he was like, "She's that good." So that was high praise, obviously from Thierry Henry, but everyone knew it around her as well. Uh, so she was a phenomenal player. So I'd say Kelly. Okay. She must have been phenomenal. You went for her pretty quickly there and you played with a lot of good players. Yeah, yeah, exactly. She's She was unbelievable. She just left foot, a wand of a left foot, and she had so much time, space, awareness, and could score goals. She had everything. Mm. Uh, somebody wants to know about your uh, most impressive Irish teammate then. Another unfair question if, if you have to pick one. But very, very difficult to, to pick one. Obviously, when I started off, it would have been Olivia O'Toole. Um, Ireland's record goal scorer, uh, basically another legend of of Irish women's football. But she, if she was around now, um, she'd be a household name because she yeah. was she was that good. Um, and the current crop, it's it's really hard to pick. But uh, uh, Katie and Denise are obviously up there at the minute. Katie McCabe and Denise O'Sullivan. Yeah, does Denise O'Sullivan ever get tired? I don't think so. I don't know what I don't know what she uh, grew up on down in Cork, but it obviously stood her in good stead. Oh my God! It's like it's like she goes from Ingolo Kante and then gets on the ball, and you know the technique is off the charts as well. I mean, it's just outrageous sometimes. Yeah, she's a she's a machine, and she's got a you know that first touch. It's like glue to her foot. So um, yeah, she's an incredible player, and we're lucky to have her. Okay. Well, listen, they're lucky to have you as well. Thanks so much for your time. I know you're busy, and like I said, you're running from training, but um, it's great to catch up, great to chat to you. And Nee Fahey, um, best of luck with Liverpool, obviously, and hope promotion happens there very soon. And most certainly, best of luck in the upcoming games with Ireland. We'll all be watching. And uh, again, thanks for the time, Nee. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, Joe. Take care. Cheers. Great to have Nee Fahey. Uh, with us and it was all thanks to uh, Cabri FC as well official global partner of Liverpool Football Club and you can check out cabrifc.com for updates on promotions and giveaways